I'd ask you to find 2 Kings with me. I think it's chapter 13, verses 14 and following. And uh, I, I, I'm off center. I don't know if you can see that, but the, the pulpit's over to the left a little bit. And it, I just, that's kind of how I feel on the inside today, just a little bit off center. So I'm going to rely on you to participate. This is a rather unusual story in 2 Kings where... Uh, Elijah has been in the ministry 66 years. Isn't that amazing? But the Bible tells us in this story that he's, he's growing old and he's growing weak. And if you read just a little further on, it says that he, he's near, near to die. He's almost ready to go to heaven. But a king, a king of the northern kingdom of the ten tribes, by the name of and some of these names sound so much alike that they're easily confused. And it's not so much that you would remember the king's name as what happened in his life. This king's name is Jehoash. It sounds a little bit like Joash that we talked about last week. But this king had a lot of problems in his life. First of all, he didn't come from a good family. Can you say that? Were, were, were your mom and dad believers and the evidence of their faith, did it really shape you? Or did you come from a, a dysfunctional family? Even the best family, the best of best families could say that they were somewhat dysfunctional. And I'm about to tell you something. I'm not proud of it. And I can talk about my family, but let me not hear you talk about my family no more than I would talk about your family. But I was one of five children. And in our experience as life, and we're all still living, we're all still married to the spouses that God gave us, but we had a hard time getting to this point. My older brother fell in love with a young lady, and before the bonds of matrimony took place, we discovered she was going to have a baby. And so my parents worked through that, and that brother is still married to that young lady. I came along, and I didn't have that experience, but I had my own experiences of flunking out of college twice, uh, running with the wrong crowd, probably sometimes contributing to their wrongness, and I found myself caught up in a lifestyle that was not worthy either of my family name or the name of Jesus, which I had professed as a child. And I'll not give you any more details. The Bible says don't glory in our sin, but I do glory in the one who saved me from my sin. The next younger brother seemed to, seemed to do some things that weren't quite to the level of what I had done. Um, the most noteworthy thing was that uh, for some reason he felt that it was necessary at a Baptist college in Texas at some point to disrobe and run across the campus. Now, that's probably the most outlandish thing that he ever did, but it was very, very inappropriate. In fact, it's against the law. And uh, we didn't find out about it for a long, long time. And I'll not tell you which brother it was, except I did say something about birth order. My sister, a beautiful lady. In fact, today, she's a grandmother, and she is a, a trustee to the North American, uh, North American Mission Board. And I'm so proud of her. But again, as life would have it, her first child was born without the benefit of having been married. And then my younger brother, who was a retired lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, and you don't work at the Pentagon, Pentagon, and you don't uh, get uh, top secret credentials unless you're a very trustworthy man. But uh, he got caught doing some of the things that I didn't get caught doing. And so when he got caught doing those things that I didn't get caught doing, he was kicked out of a university for doing those things that I didn't get caught doing. But God be praised. God is a God of grace and patience. All of my brothers and sisters have professed Christ. They have said Jesus is Lord. And it's been interesting to watch what God does with disobedient children and how he has called us all to action. And when we read this story together today, we can make... I, I realized I, I'm pretty hard on the bad examples in the Bible. I really am. I'm, I'm just frustrated with them at times. I'm irritated towards them. That they, they had what I didn't have, and they should have done better with what they had. And I apologize if I have suggested to you that I am better than they, or them, 
I'm not. And given the circumstances, I've made a mess of things in my own life. And given the circumstance that I still like sin, if I didn't like it, if it weren't fun, why would I do it? I don't like the consequences. But sin, as a friend of mine once said, we wouldn't do it if it weren't so much fun. We need to be serious about our own sin. And this young king didn't come from a good family. His father was not a godly example. And he was raised by a man who indulged wrong beliefs. And it's time that you and I recognize that our father doesn't indulge wrong beliefs. It says in the New Testament, we're to put on the mind of Christ. I'm fascinated with that phrase. What does that mean? I think it means that we would begin to see the eye through the eyes that God has given us a world destined for hell, doomed and damned because of human sin. And we as Christians have this high calling to an activity, an experience of life that is deliberate and purposeful. And so I want you to understand, even no matter where you are, even if you are on your deathbed, God has a word for you. And so we look at Elisha, and we look at Jehoash in 2 Kings chapter 13. And the scripture passage is rather short, but nonetheless, I would ask you and invite you, if you're able, to stand with me for the reading of God's word. When Elisha became sick with the illness that he died from, Jehoash, king of Israel, went down and wept over him and said, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. While you're up for just a moment, if you were with us, isn't that what Elisha said when Elijah was caught up into heaven? We'll, We'll come back to that in a moment. Elijah responded, take a bow and arrow. So he got a bow and arrows. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, put your hand to the bow. So the king put his hand on it. And Elijah put his hands on the king's hands. Elisha said, open the window. So he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot. So he shot. And then Elisha said, the Lord's arrow of victory. Yes, the arrow of victory over Aram. You are to strike down the Arameans in Aphek until you have put an end to them. And then Elisha said, take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck the ground three times and he stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. And then you would have struck down Aram until you put an end to them. But now you will only strike down Aram three times. Next week, we'll look at verse 20 and following about the death of Elijah. But at that point, you may be seated following the reading of God's Word. There's a need for you and I to respond to the call of action. And I think that if I would take anything away from Jehoash going to Elisha, there is within the human creature, the way God made us, a need for religion. In 1996, my wife and I went to India, and we were there for a number of days, and I was fascinated by the poverty. Oh, it, 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 the aroma of poverty, where rather than people having indoor plumbing because they're so very poor, many of the people are homeless there, and they live under shelters, and it's generational. There will be old, old people, and older people, and younger people, and children, and babies, generations living in poverty. And there's no place, if you'll allow me to say this, for them to go to the bathroom except where they live, on the, on the street. And thus the aroma of life, is, it, it's offensive to your sensibilities. But that is a nation that is partially Christian. There are many Christians there. There really are. There are some devout and, and godly people that love the Lord. It's also a nation heavily populated with people that are followers of Muhammad. There are a lot of Muslims there. But the most predominant faith that I saw were the Hindus. And the expression of their faith was rather interesting. There are many, many people in India that don't have enough to eat. And living next to them on the street was a certain variety or species of animal. A cow. A cow. A specific breed, the, the, the Brahma cow. And somehow they have misfigured that 
when you die, you come back, and the ideal, the optimal place to come back as would be a Brahma cow. I looked at those cows ranging the streets, and, and I mean, they put food out for the cows. They don't bring food to the poor people, but they put food out for the cows. And they make sure that the cows have fresh water. And the cows, you, you know, if they're in the road, if they lay down in the street, you're, you're not to disturb them. You're to go around them. And it's time that we in Christianity think about eating some of our holy cows. You see, the food is available. The nourishment is there. There are people that are impoverished in our world, our world, your world, the community in which you live that don't know Jesus. The other thing that I saw in the Hindu culture was the need for religion. Everywhere that you would go, there were little shrines, little piles of rocks and painted colors and flowers and incense and pieces of food as if... They were looking for God, but they didn't know which God because that's what Hinduism, they have many gods. They are what we call polytheistic. And it was strange to be driving down the road and stop at an intersection. It's scary to ride in India. They, their traffic flow is much different than ours, as bad as ours is. Uh, oftentimes, it's uh, big as right. So if you're in a tractor trailer or a bus, look out. You know, everybody else, here they come. But we would stop because of traffic, and you didn't have to look far to your right or your left, and you would see evidence of man's heart cry to know that there is a God and a God who would make a difference in their life. They wanted the same blessings that you and I would want. We want health for ourselves, health for our family. They wanted peace in their life. They wanted an opportunity to live and see their children and their grandchildren grow into uh, contributing members of society. And so on a daily basis, they go out and they take food that uh, was meant for people, and they will leave it there until it rots. And on the other side of the street, there will be a family dying from hunger. Of Jesus, he said of himself, he said, I am the living water. He said of you and I as Christians, out of us will flow rivers of water. Not only did he say of himself that he was living water, he said of himself, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I, I, I don't need candy. It doesn't do much for me. It, it really, I, I don't feel good when I eat many sweets. But let's bless the Lord, oh my soul, if you get me near to a piece of yeast bread or roll right out of the oven, oh my, oh my. Uh, there have been some restaurants where I've gone into and they've, they've said, uh, you want more bread? You know, you do have a meal coming. I, there are some yeast rolls that are so light and fluffy that, that it take a big old pat of butter. Now, some, some yeast rolls don't need butter. But you just take that while it's still hot right out of the oven. You put that pat of butter in there, and it just melts. It just permeates. And I've learned that if you mash it just a little bit, you can put the whole thing in your mouth. <laughs> and I can just sit there and luxuriate in, in the taste of bread. But Jesus said, he is the bread of life. Which says to me, uh, I had to eat of him. That's a, a, a hard concept to explain, but that's what we do with the Lord's table, to, to partake in his body for what purpose? Now, again, I, I, I'm a Baptist because I think, for me, it is the best expression of my faith. I'm not here to belittle anyone else's. But there are those people that I think are confused because they say that that bread uh, is more than a symbol. It becomes, literally becomes, the blood and the body. And I don't see that. I'm not belittling them. But how is it that we communicate to people that we have eaten of the living bread and thus we don't have little, little bloody idols outside of our house? And we don't wear a dot on our forehead to suggest to people that that's who we are. That's what we believe. When I read from God's Word, well, I just want to hear you, uh, have you hear this. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, The weapons of our wherefore are not of the flesh, but divinely power for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, let's talk about that for a moment. Not strongholds in the sense that there's this palace or this castle, but Jesus said it like this to his disciples. In fact, uh, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And it was Peter that said, thou art the Christ. 
But Jesus made reference to the, 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 the kingdom of hell and, and its w- gates coming against his kingdom. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians that I just read to you, uh, the gospel, the life story of Jesus is for the pulling down of strongholds. Let me ask you, do you have any strongholds in your life? Are there any places where you say, I just regret this about myself. I don't like this about myself. In fact, if others knew that I I wrestled with this, they would probably think less of me. I do. I do. And uh, I keep them pretty well concealed from you sometimes. But not always, not always from myself, let alone from God. Can I talk to you ladies for a moment? I love ladies. I do. I like girls. I've always liked girls better than boys in that relationship, but I like boys. Tyler and I are good friends. He likes to hug me. I uh, have a new friend in Pastor Chul, but, but help me understand something. So what's one of the last things you lady do at night is possibly, not all, but you wash your face. Why? You're not going to see anybody more. I mean, you know, they're, they're, you can turn lights out, go to sleep, you wash your face. What are you washing off? What are you washing off? That stuff called makeup. Most makeup, as I understand it, is either a man-made product or dirt. Special dirt. Colored dirt. So in the morning, you wake up and you refresh and you put on a water and wash away the residue of the night's sleep. And then you begin to put dirt on your face so that you're more attractive to somebody at least yourself. I don't understand all of that. But don't quit. Okay? Don't quit. Uh, if you ever go to Talkeetna, Alaska, uh, you will see uh, some real women much in the need of a makeover. In my humble but well-informed opinion. What does that have to do with the outside and the inside? Well, what do you do about that that stronghold in your own life? Here is Jehoash, and he knows things aren't right. And he goes to the most available, prominent, powerful believer in God's name that's still around, that he knows of, and he looks at him, and he is so moved. It's like the person that goes to church one time. They just come in, and they say, something happened there. Something was wonderful. And in the moment, I felt really good, and I sang the songs, and I prayed the prayers. I even put something in the offering plate. I even said to God, if it's always this good, I'll go back. But there are strongholds in their life. But Jehoash, he looks at Elijah, who is near unto death, and there's this spiritual declaration. It was true, and I'm thankful that he said it. But then it gets to a strange part of the story. Why would Elisha tell Jehoash to get a bow and arrow and do these things? Some of us are very visual learners. We need to see some things. In fact, wasn't there a disciple who said, I'll believe when I see? Well, what God wants you to do is to see on the inside of you. And my prayer for you is that you, from this mo- moment forward, would be more like Jesus than you've ever been. And it's, he's available. And that more is what we ought to all strive for. But when the more takes over and we begin to live the life of Christ, we can expect strongholds to be pulled down. I'm tired of the world telling us to be quiet as Christians. I'm tired of the world of uh, being cynical and skeptical about what we say, is our life. But Elisha said to the king, who probably grew up as a boy with a bow and arrow, and I did. I, I uh, grew up shooting all kinds of things. And some things I shouldn't have shot, but all kinds of weaponry. And Elisha tells the king, pick up a bow and arrow. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us that Elisha was an archer. But I want to suggest to you that to be the king in that day, to be the, the, the president, if you would, of those people, the king was a warrior king. He didn't just deploy his troops and sit in Congress in Washington, D.C. and give orders. No, he led them into battle. And so you can assume that the king probably thought for a moment, what am I doing with a bow and arrow? I have a stronghold inside. My heart's not right towards God. If you listen to the story, as soon as the archer let the arrow fly, the man of God was able to say to the person seeking God, here's what that was. 
That was God's victory over a stronghold. It, Judah and Jerusalem were faced with two external enemies at the time. One was Hadad of the Arameans, and the other one was Ben Hadad, not related, but both mean guys, from the Syrians. And the Arameans were giving the northern kingdom a lot of grief. They were abusing them. They were taking their property. They were taking their women and children. They were killing their men. They were robbing their fields. They were, they were awful people towards the people of God. And that first arrow was God's victory. Now think about that for a moment. Did that mean the king could just go back and sit on his throne and say, well, there's a battle to be fought, but I don't have to fight it because God's going to fight it for me. Not so. For him to be successful meant the king had to recognize the enemy. He had to go to action towards the enemy. And he had to defeat and destroy the enemy for once and all. Do you remember what it said? Elisha then said, What I want you to do is take the balance of your arrows out of the quiver and strike the ground. You ever sit out here and say, You know... I think I understood something today, but I'm not sure that it applies to me. Do you ever sit there and say, oh, I know that applies to me, but I'm not going to do that, that willful disobedience? I don't think so. I think you're here because you are saying, I want to be obedient. But let me make this suggestion to you. Sometimes when God is asking you to do something, it doesn't make any sense to your rational mind. It doesn't make sense. You can't reason your way to a possible outcome like Elijah is telling Jehoash, shoot an arrow, and that's an assurance of victory. But it was. How about in your New Testament where uh, Jesus says, I think in Mark 10 or Mark 12, where Jesus says, all things are possible with God. Just one little arrow was a symbol, a sign that God was going to be victorious in Jehoash's life. That, that, that's not, you know, the. any of you ever seen the lightning storms in West Texas? Oh, my soul, it's called chain lightning. And sometimes the whole sky is illuminated, and it starts as far as you can see to this direction, and it just runs across the horizon, and it just comes down, and it's amazing. And the God who made that lightning is the same God who can take something as simple as one arrow and give His word that it will accomplish His purpose in your life. Isn't that amazing? That's the God we know, and the, the one that we say that we love and we want to follow and, and be obedient to. I want to remind you, we've been studying in the book of Zechariah. It says in chapter 4, verse 6, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. I want to ask you, are you a good listener? A good listener takes what they hear and puts it into action. How much more Bible do you need to hear or have explained to you and outlined before you say, I've got it. God saved me. I'm really saved. If I were to die right now, I would leave behind this vessel destined for death, and I would step into the presence of the Lord. You you do believe that, don't you? I I would hope you don't need one more sermon, but guess what? You might not live long enough for that next sermon. So if you're not yet convinced that He is Lord and He is available to become your Lord, make that decision and say yes to Jesus. But having made that decision, if you don't need any more preaching and singing, and oh, I love to preach as long as you'll listen, and I love to hear the choir sing as long as they will, but I'm ready for some action. I want to see souls saved, and souls are saved by people who are transformed by a single act of obedience. It's simple. Where next or to whom next are you to carry the gospel? It's as simple as that. Lord, you've given me a new day. To whom and to where should I go and speak the name of Jesus? And guess what you'll discover when you get there? The arrow of God has already begun to work in that person's life. And I want to tell you something. Some of them will be as mean and nasty as the devil himself. Oh, pastor, I wish you hadn't told me that. That makes me frightened. 
All things are possible with God. Isn't, who is our authority in saying that? It's, it's Jesus. And so if you don't have confidence in Jesus, you might not have confidence in your own salvation. And I'm not trying to cause you to call into question your salvation. I just would like to see a little activity that says, that person saved because they're being obedient to God Almighty. If you're active, you're making some effort, what would we expect to see? They both start with R. One would be a, re- a report that you'd come back and say, guess what I saw God do? Guess what I saw God do with my act of obedience? A report. A report. Something, a lot of good things happened yesterday, a lot of humor. But um, when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden on that night, he was betrayed by Judas. Actually, he was betrayed by everybody. Do you, do you remember that story? No one went with Jesus. They all fled. John Mark was there as a young follower of Christ. And the Bible says that in that dark night, as they were reaching to grab the disciples, do you remember what happened to John Mark? He fled. And they pulled his garments off. And rather than be taken captive and be identified with Christ, he'd rather have left naked and leave his clothes. That's a pretty desperate man that says, I don't want want my life identified with that man. A little while ago, the phone rang. I answered it. There was a young man from Washington. At least he sounds young. And he says, I was there yesterday. And I said, thank you for coming. What can I do for you? He said, I left my clothes there. Now, he did. They're over in the fellowship hall. He wants us to mail his clothes. But I didn't say to him because I would only say it to you. I won't tell you his name or who he's related to. But I would say to you, and immediately my imagination went to John Mark. Was he so uncomfortable here that he fled here yesterday in a desperate way to get away from the reports that we were sharing about Jesus? Possibly. I'm sure he took clothes home because he did tell me he changed clothes. Pastor, why do you think like that? Because I am looking for the reports. Not only am I listening for the reports, I'm asking God for results. Results. Now, notice what Elisha did. He didn't tell the king how to shoot the arrow. He said, shoot the arrow. And then what did Elisha do? He laid his hands on him. He blessed him. He didn't cause him to, you know, extra resistance so the arrow would go in a specific direction. He didn't strengthen the pole so it would go further. He blessed him. He touched him. Human touch is so important. But the touch in Jesus' name, it will change someone's eternal destiny. Just for giggles, just for fun, not ha-ha fun, but I want you to look at Luke's gospel, chapter 9. And the title of today's sermon is Robbing God. And I think we as Christians have been robbing God for a long time. Now, it says in the book of Malachi, would a man rob God concerning material possessions or money? And the answer is yes. But I think we might have been robbing God of opportunities to be God to people that need to know him. So in Luke's gospel, chapter 9, there's a lot of things that happen. Let me just summarize a few of them. The 12 feed the 5,000. There's Peter's confession. In that same chapter, Jesus predicts his death. In that same chapter, Jesus says to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. And in that same chapter, Jesus is transfigured. He goes up on the mountaintop with some of his disciples, and he appears there, and his appearance is changed. But what I want you to do is look at verses 15. 57 and following with me for just a few moments that we stay together. As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Have you ever thought about saying to God, God, I'll go wherever you impress me to go? I mean, that's a rather bold statement, but could it not also be a bland statement? Because at this point you said, well, God's never asked me to go any place that I needed God to take me there. Could it be that you've robbed God of an opportunity? That's a simple prayer. Lord, I'll go with you wherever you ask me to go. But Jesus being Jesus is kind to us. Look what he says there in the verse that follows. Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And Jesus also says in the Sermon on the Mount, 
Don't worry about what you have to eat or don't eat, and don't worry about your clothes. Consider the lilies of the field. Consider the birds of the air. One of the things that's interesting about how God feeds the birds, the food's available, but he doesn't throw it in their nest. They have to go find it. Jesus said, come follow me, but he lets us know that it's going to be a challenge to be a Christ follower. Can I really challenge you today to begin to think about, is my faith of today a challenge to hell? I'll follow you, Jesus, as long as it's where I go, to whom I'd be comfortable with, as long as they sing the music that I like and the pastor preaches biblically, but uh, not with a challenge. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened to that man, but what's the implication? What is the suggestion? He went, whoa, at least a Motel 6, because they'll leave the light on for you. Then read on with me. Then he said to another, so the first was a man said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus noticed what I call a hanger on her. That's not proper grammar, but, it, you know, just one of those kind of lingering along thinking. And Jesus looked at that one and said, hey, you, you, follow me. Lord, isn't that a wonderful word? That's powerful. Master, king of kings, king of glory, Lord. Uh, what's it say? Let me first go bury my father. Now, I wonder about that. The Bible doesn't tell us how old the man was, but let's suggest that he was very young and his father was still alive. One of these days, Lord, the time will come when I don't have the responsibilities to family and I'm ready. Or perhaps, maybe the father was like Elisha, near unto death. And you see, when we follow Christ, we need to love him more than we love any other. It might have been hard for the young man to leave his father because he might have been the firstborn. And what would he have done as the firstborn son? He would have inherited everything that the father had amassed in life. Was Jesus being insensitive? No. Jesus knew the man's heart and thoughts. He knew when he singled him out and he said, follow me, that it was that specific call. But the man had a good reason to not follow Jesus, if there is such a thing. But Jesus responded in verse 60, he said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go, and what is he supposed to do? Spread the good news. Spread the good news. That's pretty direct, isn't it? But it's not just news, it's news of the kingdom of God. And what is God's kingdom able to do? To pull down strongholds. Uh, That's why I went to India. I didn't go to India because I wanted to smell bad stuff and see people in poverty. I went there to share the good news. And you might say, well, I can't go to India, but I would if God would ask me. Really? Ask him. I'll wait a moment. Say, Lord, you want me to go to India as a missionary? I don't know what he said, but he has an answer to that question. And then lastly, there's another one. I like this guy. I like this guy. He he knew that Jesus was calling people out. Jesus Jesus is like that. He gets right down to the person. And this guy anticipated that Jesus was going to look at him next. And he said, Lord, I will follow you, Lord. But at least let me go say goodbye. Because today is baking day at my house. And the yeast rolls are about to come out of the oven. A Jewish man would know that at times, to be obedient to God, there would be no yeast found in the house. And that calls for discipline and action. And this, this man or another, it could have been a woman. I will follow you, Lord, but let me first go and say goodbye to those at my house. But Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Another way of saying that is a person who is not obedient doesn't fit in the kingdom. 
not past tense. What did Jesus come preaching? He came preaching the kingdom. The kingdom is here and now. And these, these examples, just like Jehoash, it's within our inclination and our impulse to search out the things of God. It's a call for action, but it's also a call for obedience. I can almost hear Joash saying, Elisha, you can't tell me what to do. I'm the king, and I have an archer. I have the best in the kingdom, and he's my right-hand man. And if I want that arrow to go further and mean more, I'll let somebody else do it. Jehoash, so near to God, and yet he missed out. They went to war, and they won three significant battles over the Arameans. But then you know what happened? They lost the war. Jesus is the victory. You might still be engaged in the battle, but the victory's won. And our neighbors, our friends, our family members, and some of them are really hard to talk to about Jesus, at least those that are blood-related to me. Some of them are so hard-hearted and devilish, I was never like that. Forgive me. I am like that. But I have decided to follow Jesus. As we stand together and sing, and you look at your circumstances and situation, would you ask God, to whom would I go? Where would I go? And you already know what to say. As we stand together and sing, if you'll just breathe that prayer, and if God says yes and gives you direction, then I'd only ask for you to be obedient. Because that's what God wants you to do. To say, truly, I will follow you anywhere because of who Christ is and what he did on the cross for me as we sing.